Hello, my dear friends, and welcome back for another splendid and riveting episode of our Mining Empire series. I actually have a lot to unpack for you guys today. Today's episode's not going to be exactly like any other we've done before. It is quite unique. So without further ado, let us begin. Now, when I say today's episode is going to be quite unique, I do mean that. However, it doesn't start out that way. We actually start out with Captain Hawthorne researching prosthetics. Now, a good question would be, Rat Knight, why the hell are you researching prosthetics? Let me show you. So, Konar here is missing one of her legs, just as well Sandra's jaw is shattered. Now, prosthetics won't help with the jaw. We could just go ahead and install a denture, which we plan on doing. However, when people are starting to lose limbs, probably a good idea to go ahead and start looking into some prosthetics. And one of the most beautiful things of our technology of this day and age with our fancy machinery, we can actually make prosthetic limbs at the machining table and it cuts the time, I mean it's a fraction of the time from the previous two series where we had to make them at a crafting spot and it took absolutely forever. But with that being said, Happy Oak has finished up our very first prosthetic leg. We plan on installing this on Konar and now we kind of have the technique down so Happy Oak can make plenty of prosthetic limbs for anyone else who may need them. Just after that of course we have Beyonder go ahead and begin installing some of this so he began installing the jaw on Sandra. Now it is worth mentioning as well everyone was talking about how Shortus was such a badass a few episodes ago when he escaped the mining empire. He is actually the one that shattered Sandra's jaw when they got into a scuffle when he was escaping. But I digress. Now Konar has a beautiful prosthetic leg that is fully functional just as well well, Sandra has a functional jaw. In the meantime, the rebel prisoner Scott were trying to brainwash, decided to go berserk and try to make an escape. Luckily, Captain Hawthorne came in with his Bowie knife and stopped him pretty easily. It also helped that he explained to him that if this were to happen again, it would cost him his life. We've also been getting several sightings of rebels at a nearby abandoned complex not too far from the base, so we decided we would take out our helicopter and go and investigate. Now you may say to yourself that it is quite foolish of the rebels to set up a base so close to our base. However, there could be a reason for that. It is very possible they are setting up a staging ground for an attack or a siege or something of that sort on a much larger scale than we've seen. Captain Hawthorne put the helicopter down next to a small pond. From the air, we could see exactly what this abandoned complex was. The abandoned complex appears to have been a log warehouse, so this would have been where the colonial powers back in the day before forming the Marshal Service would have stored all of their logs. On the walk to the complex, Hawthorne began recounting tales he heard as a boy growing up about a logging emperor of sorts back then. He just could not remember the name. Unfortunately though, the conversation was cut short as they noticed several corpses in front of the complex as well as many blood stains, skull spikes. It would appear that this place is no longer abandoned. Sandra and Sev would lead the charge here, both of them quickly breaching the door looking for enemies inside while the others followed behind. The main room was devoid of life, however there was still a lit campfire and two separate gin stills. It would appear that this place is almost definitely populated by rebels. We would then begin clearing out the other rooms. After entering another room very quickly, a thromboian with a golden sword charged at our soldiers. Luckily, they fired upon him and were able to easily subdue him with their bullets. These aren't exactly the rebels that we intended on seeing here. Yes, the thromboians are part of the rebellion, but these Thromboians with their own weaponry appear to be from their own tribe. It doesn't appear that Tree or Bacchus' soldiers are here just yet. However, as we continued clearing out the massive complex, we began into another room and quickly encountered a massive armored warg that was trained to attack. Luckily though, after a bit of gunplay, we were easily able to subdue it. It would appear that this is the only warg here, indicating that the force of Thromboians in this complex, as we've previously seen, 
seen as well, is not very large. So realistically, there can't be too many of them left here, I would assume. But we once again went back to clearing out the rooms of the complex. In this new room, we found a large thromboian male who was towering over all of us with a set of armor and a bow and arrow. We quickly downed him, and luckily he did not die, which was perfect because with his massive muscles, he would do very well in the mines. Sev also took it upon herself to clear out the final room of the complex. After entering the room, she encountered a female thromboian wielding a hammer. She appeared to be a blacksmith of sorts. But with the complex cleared, we could haul our new thromboian slaves back to base as well as the armor and other goodies that they had here. And with that being said, as that goes on, I want to mention I apologize. There's no sound from the game right now. I didn't realize, but OBS was not capturing that. It does come back later on in the video, though. It took some time, but eventually our soldiers did finally make it all the way back home with all their new armor and resources, as well as our our two prisoners who are going to be slaves. And so once again to reiterate the jobs that we're going to be giving them, the larger thromboyan male is going to be a miner because of course he has that beautiful massive physique for it, right? Now the younger female, or the smaller female I should say, is most likely going to be putting her smithing skills to use with the machining table and tailoring and things of that sort essentially. The female thromboyan blacksmith was known as Frit and she he seemed to fit right in with the other slaves. They were all stuffed in their tiny little room, which actually makes me think that maybe we should try and build them something more comfortable. But first, before we do that, we should really celebrate the victory of our soldiers with some more recreational items. We built them a new wonderful poker table and forced Happy Oak to build them a gramophone so they can all listen to music as they have their recreation activities. Ah, uh, we also got a good shot of Larkot traveling through the dark and dreary mines. Dark as a dungeon, one might say. Yes, it is dark as a dungeon and damp as the dew. Leave a comment if you get that reference. Some time later, Konar marched into the prison and began discussing with Trog about how if he doesn't decide to join them by this point as it's been days since he's been captured, they'll kill him and he decides to join. Though the Thromboians are a very noble tribe, and they are very fierce when they're alone under a mountain in a dark, damp prison. I'm sure that they would do just about anything to get out alive. After a serious poker match between many of our soldiers, everyone began working on a large section of the mountain where we could actually put our new slave quarters as we're getting so many more slaves. During this lengthy process, we did finally manage to also brainwash the rebel known as Scott, and he is now a Rimworld Marshal soldier. Captain Hawthorne even greeted him by saying, Welcome to the right side of the war, my friend. A true heartwarming sentiment, I'm sure. Then finally, after a good bit of time had passed, we had finally completed our new slave quarters, and might I just say, it looks mighty comfortable in there, and very beautiful, compared to the last, at least. The very next day, it was that time of the year. We ended up having our resource tax collectors come from the Rimworld Marshal Service. Finally, we would be able to give them plenty of slate blocks, just as well, Captain Hawthorne had a very special letter for his sister that he would give to them so they could deliver it. Unfortunately though, unbeknownst to us and the soldiers, disaster was just around the corner. The Marshall soldiers had no idea they were actually being followed and tracked for many miles by a group of Thromboians. They immediately began assaulting the resource caravan. During the beginning of the battle, it did look good for the Marshals as they were heavily armed, but some accidental friendly fire changed the course of battle. A rocket hit several of the soldiers, killing them, and the Thromboians were not letting up. The tide of battle had truly turned in the Thromboians' favor. They still had several of their raiders as well as their animals that were armored. And unfortunately, the Marshall soldiers were dropping like flies. After the Thromboians had killed every single one of them, they then turned their attention towards us. Luckily though, prior to this, we had set up several slate spike traps in the caves because we knew enemies would be traveling through there. This would help us out quite a bit and would actually take out several of their dogs as well as a few of their soldiers. Now with their ranks thinned out as much as possible by the resource caravan as well as several of our traps that we laid previously, 
there was but one thing left to do. Open up a fine, crisp can of whoop-ass. We opened fire upon them, killing every single one that we could, and then when they began fleeing, we began pursuing them. Not even this big ugly son of a bitch and his big precious armored polar bear were enough to get away from us. But now with the raiders defeated, there was still the question of how we would deliver the resources. So, we decided to have Happy Oak build a telegraph. This was long overdue. We needed this to communicate with the overall martial government on a semi-regular basis. But of course, here in the Northern Mountains, infrastructure isn't exactly up to par. So we only just recently got telegraph lines, which did end up working out perfectly. Otherwise, we would have to fly to a martial base to even just speak with them. With that being said, though, the higher command have ordered Hawthorne to send some soldiers through the helicopter with all the slate blocks that we owe the government, just as well we have been ordered of course to bury our dead, which we of course planned on doing anyhow to respect them. For the resource delivery mission, Hawthorne has chosen Beryl and Scott. This would be a perfect opportunity for Scott to kind of get a feel of things on these missions, and Beryl would be the perfect person to teach him. So we began the long and lengthy process of loading up over 1,000 slate blocks to take to a local base. And now we were speaking of infrastructure earlier with the telegraph lines, but this slate and the other resources that we're actually digging out of the mountain are going to be perfect for infrastructure such as roads and just construction in general throughout our empire. The two of them dropped off the resources and began making their way all the way back home. Everything was great. It was even hunky-dory. Hey, wait a minute. Are those, are those rebels? Oh dear God, no. Scott and Beryl both emerged from the wreckage severely burned, but they were both alive. The helicopter, of course, was obviously destroyed. It was nothing more than metal wreckage on the ground. Beryl was burned so badly, in fact, that her nose was actually burned off in the wreckage. The two of them tended to their wounds late into the night, just before passing out from exhaustion. The only thing on their minds? To survive. To try to get back home as soon as possible but also not to die in the process, which would mean, of course, they would need to eat to keep their strength up so they could try to return home. Luckily, they harvested some cherries from a tree, and then they would continue their journey. It would take an extremely long time to get home on foot, especially recovering from injuries. Luckily, there was a local town nearby known as Dover, controlled by the Marshal Service. They began making their way there. Days later, our two brave soldiers had finally made it just on the outskirts of the city of Dover. They began approaching the city entrance. After a brief moment of speaking with the guard at the city entrance, he explained that the city was actually under attack by a rebel uprising. He of course quickly recognized their uniforms. They were obviously soldiers from the northern mountains. Scott explained that they were under Captain Hawthorne. After hearing this, the guard begged for their assistance in the battle for the city. Given their very limited options, Beryl and Scott quickly entered the city to extinguish the flames of rebellion. They could hear gunfire in the distance as the city streets were littered with corpses, martial service, and rebel. They came upon a squad of martial soldiers fighting off the rebels and quickly joined in. They were all packed very tightly in the city streets between the buildings. Arrows and bullets were whizzing by their heads and their bodies, hitting the sandbags in front of them, as well as hitting many of their allies standing nearby. The rebels fought very fiercely, like clockwork. It was extremely apparent that this attack had been been planned out months in advance. The settlers and the Thromboians had never worked together so well before in a battle. It was extremely impressive. However, our men did manage to beat them back just a little bit. The rebels began a strategic retreat. We also advanced to a crowded city street where many of the martial soldiers were fighting off several rebels as well. And of course, we quickly joined in the fight to help our brethren defeat these filthy rebels. With the rebel ranks beginning to thin, they became desperate and they began throwing the last grenades that they had at our soldiers. Unfortunately, one of these grenades landed at Beryl's feet and it detonated. Scott began sprinting towards her to pick her up and take her to safety. She was alive, but unfortunately her body was shredded by the grenade. We managed to push the rebels back and it looked as though victory would be ours. 
However, it was during this time that just outside the city streets of Dover, Shortus arrived with a battalion of artillerymen. This appears to be the rebels' plan B. Now that all the civilians are either dead from the marshals or they've escaped the city as well as the rebel soldiers, Shortus was free to bomb the city full of martial soldiers. After bombing the city streets and killing as many martial soldiers as possible, Shortus and his battalion of artillerymen began patrolling the streets for any survivors. They came upon a martial soldier crying out in agony and pain on the ground, completely mangled by the bombs. Shortus, compelled by his morality, decided to kill the man to spare him of any more pain. Though the rebels hate the marshals and they are enemies, they are more sympathetic to these types of concerns, even from their enemies. Luckily, during the time of bombing, Scott had already pulled Beryl inside to begin tending to her wounds. Thus, the two of them did survive the bomb blast. But with that being said, Beryl is extremely injured still from the grenade that detonated on her and would still require a lot of tending. Scott, of course, promptly began attending to her wounds to ensure that she would not bleed out throughout the night. Unfortunately, though, of course, he did not have access access to any medicine, so this process would take a very long time, and just as well, it was extremely painful for Beryl. So painful, in fact, that you could hear her cries of agony throughout the city streets, unfortunately, meaning that the rebels were now aware that someone was hiding within this building, and they were determined to find out who. Shortus quickly began throwing grenades at the door to blow a massive hole through it. He and the rebel soldiers entered promptly and came upon Scott wielding his rifle. If he were to drop his rifle, they would give him mercy and they would not kill him in barrel. So, of course, with his limited options, he did comply to this order. The rebels quickly arrested both of them and began heading out of the city. Scott did not want to take this option. Obviously, he is a very prideful person, given that he is a new member of the Marshal Service as well. However, this was the only way to ensure that they both survived. Back home, Captain Hawthorne was pacing the floors, worried about our two soldiers, and worried about his massive helicopter that he had just built. It had been many days since they had left. They should have been back by now, he said to himself. He decided that he would ring up the Marshal Service City that they were delivering the resources to to find out if they had any information. Unfortunately, a telegraph did come back explaining that they had spotted the helicopter shot down out of the sky by what appeared to have been rebels with no survivors in the wreckage once they sent out a search party. Hawthorne, as well as the others, were of course extremely devastated by this news. Hawthorne decided to commemorate their brave sacrifice with a memorial statue. No, it wasn't perfect, but uh, without having any remains from the wreckage to bury, it was the best that he could do. Obviously, of course, they were completely unaware that the two of them were still alive. But, my dear friends, this is the end of the episode. I hope you all have enjoyed very much. This episode was a lot of fun to actually create, okay? I mean, I know it's a little bit different than what we normally do, but I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Be sure to let me know what you think of kind of the more cinematic battles and storytelling that we're doing instead of just normal, um, you know, narrating over gameplay. Um, with like the whole city battle and stuff like that that was so much fun to do you know it's awesome and i really think it's I, th I think it's a very interesting turn to take narratively right because even though we're still playing the game when it comes down to that this is a different kind of thing right we're not playing it as like a colony builder we're showing the war that's actually going on and that does bring up the fact that i want to give credit to this wonderful idea to our friend delta 1296 who said that they love the universe of course and they hope that they get to see the front lines well my friend this is the beginning of seeing the front lines and if everyone enjoys we will definitely continue to do so we'll show more and more of this type of thing throughout actual videos instead of just like through the intros and whatnot like we have been doing but guys once again thank you ever so much for watching today's episode and thank you for your support on the episodes the series overall the channel me i love you guys ever so much and i'm going to take a moment to shamelessly plug my new twitter i just made i normally don't give a shit about stuff like that like twitter but i don't know um you know i, I want to make one <laughs> so if you guys want to follow me on that the link is in the channel bio and stuff like that so i thought you guys uh thought you guys might want to do that but <laughs> 
<laughs> I love you guys. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.